Well, good morning, folks. This is Maria Bowie. Um, I work as a program coordinator in the Office of the Associate Dean for Extension. And this morning, we have a great program for you on growing and using medicinal herbs. Noelle Joy has a certificate in herbal medicine and an MS in horticulture from the University of Georgia. She, her research actually focused on holy basil and she now serves as the director of medicinal herbs at Garden, a demonstration farm at the University of Georgia. She's also working on her PhD in horticulture at UGA studying hemp. Rebecca Hardiman serves as the county extension coordinator in Clayton County and she provides leadership in the three program areas and administrative oversight for program enhancement, resource allocation, and fiscal compliance. With over 20 years of experience in non-traditional education, she is a lifelong learner and always seeking more knowledge. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to Noelle. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to share about growing medicinal herbs. It's definitely something that I'm most passionate about and could talk about forever. Uh, there's a lot of things that I wanna cover in the next uh, few minutes, but yeah, to just uh, um, go on a little bit more about the introduction, I manage U Garden Herbs, which is a medicinal herb program at U Garden, which is a student teaching farm here at UGA. Uh, and we grow about 40 different medicinal herbs and then dry them and put them into a line of herbal products that we sell in the community. So it's really cool to be able to offer this agricultural business that then we can have students and interns and people come in and volunteer and learn about herb production and business and all kinds of different things. So it's been an awesome experience. And like Maria said, I'm also working on my PhD studying hemp and just really interested in this idea of horticulture and chemistry and growing plants that have these medicinal compounds that can affect our health in positive ways and kind of understanding that relationship of how we can grow really high quality plants. So yeah, I'm really excited about the opportunity to share with you today about some things about growing herbs. So I'm going to share my screen. and start the presentation. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, my name is Noelle Joy and excited to get into it, growing medicinal herbs. Okay, so uh, whenever someone is starting to uh, plant a garden or want to put in some new herbs, because uh, I'm kind of focusing this talk towards if someone wants to grow in their backyard, in some pots, or in a place in their garden. Um, some things to think about are uh, what herbs do you like? Um, there's a lot of different herbs that are possibilities and they can uh, fit into a lot of different areas. Maybe you wanna grow herbs for tea or maybe you want to grow herbs that you can put fresh into cooking. A lot of different options. So it's good to start with what you like because usually it's easier to grow things that you like. <laughs> um, how do you plan to use them and how much time do you have? How much space do you have? There's a lot of different considerations and uh, it's good to think about these things because it can be easy to just sow a bunch of seeds or get excited about a bunch of plants and then it can feel disappointing or difficult if later on in the season it's not actually something you like or you don't have time to work with it. And so yeah, planning ahead is always good. Um, some more questions to ask are what are your property limitations and opportunities it's nice with medicinal herbs because there's so many different kinds we can incorporate them in a lot of different ways so maybe you have woods in your backyard or you have a really wet area or maybe there's like area between the sun and the woods it's kind of shady half sunny half shady or an open field um, or some pots in your backyard or a windowsill in your kitchen. So because there's so many different herbs and they a lot of them have different requirements, that means you have a lot of options of where you could tuck them into different spaces where they're gonna grow really well for you. And you're not having to do a bunch of work to modify the landscape. You can kind of just put them where they wanna grow anyway. So it's good to think about that and kind of match the plant with the area on your property um, and thinking about things like space, light, soil, and water. And really, yeah, there are many different types of herbs you could choose based on 
uh, you can choose specific ones based on the answers to these questions. So uh, maybe it's the researcher in me, uh, maybe I'm just one who likes to plan ahead, but having this really good foundation and then choosing plants from there, I feel like is really beneficial and really sets you up for success. So what I'm going to do, because I'm more of a systems thinker, uh, is talk about some of the different ways or things that you want to think about when growing medicinal herbs. And then you can kind of take that information and seeing um, questions you might want to ask or things you want to think about when you're then selecting herbs for your property. So starting with seed sourcing, um, here are some companies that I really like. It's definitely not an exhaustive list, but um, there's some, you know, there's a lot of great companies, but these are the ones that we use. One of them is Strictly Medicinal Seed. They have a lot of really good, they, they have pretty much any herb seed you can think of. Um, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is more regional and it, they have a lot of really good options um, and things that they've trialed in the Southeast. And then Johnny Seeds I like because they have certain varieties that have maybe disease resistance um, or other characteristics. Again, that's kind of bred and specifically suited for the Southeast and our kind of high humidity, uh, hot temperatures. So those are some great ones. And with medicinal herb seeds, a lot of times they're more wild. And so sometimes they require specific kind of special treatment. And so things you might come across when you're trying to start medicinal herb seeds is something called scarification. And that means that you need to nick or kind of break the seed coat in a certain way uh, to help it ease, make it easier for the seed to germinate. And so that might mean rubbing it with some sandpaper or nicking it with an X-Acto knife or something like that, or even sometimes kind of break, breaking it open with a rock. Um, I've, I've heard some people doing that. And um, the idea with these things is that in nature, it, there's certain processes that would need to happen for the seed to kind of be signaled to germinate. And so we're trying to recreate those conditions so it'll it'll germinate for us. And another thing that might need to happen is stratification where it's um, been under, like maybe uh, in nature, it's exposed to cold period for a while and it needs that to, to kind of influence the hormones to be able to germinate the seed. And so we can recreate that by putting it in some damp sand and putting it in the fridge for uh, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And uh, something else that you might come across is heat requirements, especially for some of these really heat loving summer herbs. If you're wanting to start them early inside or maybe in a small greenhouse, it's good to put them on a heat mat and then they'll pop right up where if they didn't have that, it would take a long time to germinate. And, and something else would be soaking, uh, maybe just putting them in some warm water overnight before you sow them. And these are, yeah, just some things that you might find on seed packets when you're starting to grow herbs. Uh, and again, that's kind of like having it match conditions that it would have in nature that would be required for it to germinate. In terms of planting, um, I didn't have a lot of pictures of putting you know, plants in a garden outside or in pots, but I think a lot of the same principles apply uh, that you wanna think about the soil and the fertilizer of the soil. So maybe doing a soil test um, or getting a specific type of potting soil. And what we use, we grow all organically. And um, when we're growing the plants in the trays and right when we plant them, we'll fertilize with a fish emulsion. And that's a really uh, quick to uptake form of fertilizer for the plants to help them, um, to help them kind of bounce back really quickly. Um, and then, or not bounce back, but give them a flush of growth. And then we will put chicken feather meal and mix it into the soil. And that's a slow release form of nitrogen because a lot of plants um, or plants need nitrogen to have really healthy green leafy growth. And so uh, we try to find organic sources of those and those are the fertilizers we use, but there's a lot of great options out there. Um, but it's important to think about having good fertility in the soil, making sure you're checking plant spacing. A lot of plants have different space requirements and kind of going to what I said earlier, observing microclimates on your property. Maybe you have a little wet spot and instead of bringing in soil or putting in a raised bed to make it drain better, maybe there's a plant that really likes wet feet that you could put there that would 
be perfect for that microclimate. And so we actually, just as a quick example, we have a field that is kind of the top of the field is a little bit higher up and then it dips down a little bit. And so in the top half of the field, we grow our Mediterranean herbs that really like well-drained soil like rosemary and thyme and oregano. And then lower in the plot, we grow herbs that like it a little bit more wet, like plantain and comfrey and goldenrod. And so what we're trying to do is work with nature basically. And, and again, match plants to environments that they like to be in. So we have to do less work. So um, something else I wanted to quickly mention is pest control and kind of this idea of how much we want to baby our herbs because herbs, these medicinal compounds that are found in the herbs, they have a lot of medicinal action, you know, um, things like essential oils or antioxidants. And, you know, it's funny to think about, but they don't produce those compounds for us they produce those compounds to protect themselves from sun damage and from pests and to attract pollinators to prevent disease. And so we don't wanna baby the plants too much. We don't wanna over fertilize or over water or even like spray a lot of um, pesticides or anything like that, even if they're natural ones, because having a little bit of stress will actually help the plants to be more robust and more medicinal and more potent and more flavorful. So of course, if something's like attacking the plant and it's going to die, we're going to take care of that. But in general, if it's just a little bit of pest pressure, um, we'll just leave it and kind of let the plant work through it itself. Um, and, and then that kind of leads to higher quality plants in my, in my experience. And so it's, we're kind of, I like this idea or I think about this idea of like, we're, we're kind of growing plants for their secondary metabolites. And so what we want is a lot of, um, a lot of those compounds. Um, and it's going to, like I said, give us more flavor. So something to think about when you're growing herbs and maybe a little bit of neglect might, might do them good. Okay. So when we're harvesting, um, every herb is unique. And so what we want to think about is what part of the plant we want to harvest, what time of year, and then how does it need to be processed and dried so that we're ready for it when it's when it's time to happen. So um, there one type of plant part that you might harvest is the flowers. An example of that is roses on the right here and chamomile on the left. And when we're harvesting flowers or any plant part, we're wanting to think about where the energy is in the plant. And so with flowers, the energy is going to that part, part of the plant right as the flower's opening. Um, if we wait until after it's been open for a while and it's been pollinated and going into seed production, then we're that, that isn't that flower is not going to be as vibrant or not as medicinal. And so, yeah, so, so that's something when you're thinking about flowers, you want to get them right as they're opening. Another example of a plant part you might harvest is just the leaf. So before it flowers and uh, lemon balm is on the left here and lemongrass is on the right. Those are some examples of herbs that you would harvest in leaf. And so, um, yeah, wanting to get it when it's really lush and green and beautiful. Another example would be something that we call aerial parts. And that means it's the leaf and flower. And we're wanting to get it when most of the plant is blooming, the blooms are kind of opening halfway up and that's when it's at its peak flowering time. And what we'll do for holy basil and other plants like this is we'll cut it off. Um, we'll kind of cut the whole plant back and it uh, will have the leaf and flower that we dry and then we'll leave enough of the plant, maybe six to eight inches of the plant that then will regrow uh, and we can take multiple harvests throughout the season. So, yep, this is another example of a plant part that you might harvest where it's leaf and flower. And it's interesting if you think about like culinary basil, when it flowers, the chemistry changes. So with culinary basil, the it gets a lot sharper of a taste um, and maybe not as nice. And so you want to cut your basil before it flowers because the essential oil profile changes when it goes under flowering. And so with other medicinal herbs like holy basil, we want that transition of the essential oils so that it's like the most desirable when it's flowering. And so that's something to think about when you're growing an herb is, you know, is it better to harvest it before or after flowering? 
And then finally, um, when you're harvesting roots, this actually is dandelion root right here, but we also harv we also grow ginger, which I guess is a rhizome and not a root, but you know, it grows underground. And when we're harvesting roots, we want to harvest it when the weather cools off and the above ground parts of the plant start to die back. And that means that all the energy in the plant is going towards the roots and the sugars and the nutrients to kind of store it over the winter. And that's when it's the most vibrant and most vital and juiciest. Uh, so the roots we actually harvest at the end of the season going into the winter. So those are some examples of plant parts that you might harvest and when you might harvest them. What we do for most of our herbs, unless it's just buds like roses, we don't wash because um, they're so delicate, but most everything else, any leafy crops, or roots, we will do a wash on them. And that's just to get off any dirt that's been splashed up um, or, you know, any bug, you know, like if there are some bugs on there, if it's got some remains from that um, or anything crawling through the field, you know, we're just wanting to wash off that, that residue. And so we will do that. Um, it's good practice. And then for drying, I want to talk a little bit about that. That's kind of my specialty because we grow a lot of herbs that we dry and then put into teas and seasoning blends. Um, Rebecca will be talking about some other things that you can do with herbs in terms of adding them to cooking. So definitely stay on and, and listen to her talk. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to mention just a few things about drying and that's kind of preserving the harvest so you can grow something. Maybe you wanna start a tea garden and you can dry those herbs and then use them throughout the rest of the year after the season is over. So just some things to think about with drying is that it's influenced by airflow, temperature, and humidity. And so you can adjust those things to um, adjust the drying uh, time of your, of your crop. So you can definitely, if you have a dehydrator, you can use a dehydrator that will dry it really quickly. And then here's some other setups that I've used in a home setting for drying, because you know, you're probably not going to be growing this much holy basil, which we've got hanging up on a panel um, in a dry room at the farm, but on a smaller scale, uh, you can use a cookie rack. Um, what I've done is bundle some herbs and uh, with some twine and then put a, a paper clip on it to kind of hook it onto a, um, a hanger that I have on a curtain rod. So that's one thing if you see in the top left. And then this bigger picture in the middle, I just had an accordion clothes drying rack with some repurposed screens that I, I put on there that I could you know, spread out my herbs. And then I just put that under a ceiling fan in a room in a house I used to live in. So there's some great options here um, from really small scale to a little bit larger scale of ways that you can dry herbs at home. And some herbs require processing before drying. So this is some ginger that we sliced up that we grew. And then the dandelion picture that I gave you an example of earlier, if we tried to dry that whole thing without cutting it up, it'd be an issue for two reasons. One, it would dry on the outside, but mold on the inside. Um, but then also if you dried it as one big chunk, it would be impossible to powder or break up after that. And so just again, something to think about um, if you are wanting to grow any kind of roots, then they'll probably need some kind of slicing before you dry them. And then a lot of other herbs, once they're dried, like leafy herbs, you would maybe process them after they're dried. Um, with a lot of medicinal herbs that are leafy, the stem doesn't really contain a lot of essential oils. So you'd want to strip the leaf or the leaf and flower off the stem. But I wanted to talk quickly about how you know if an herb is dried, because sometimes it can kind of be tough to tell. So usually the stem is what contains the most moisture in the plant. And so to tell when something is dry, if you snap the stem and if it snaps in half really easily and doesn't bend, that's a good way of knowing that it's dried. And then you can take a leaf and kind of crumble it in your hands. And if it crumbles easily and isn't like bendy or wet feeling, then you know it's dry. And so because we don't want to be losing a bunch of the essential oils or the antioxidants or other, you know, beneficial qualities in the plant, as soon as it's dry, we want to, we want to um, put it into a container so, so that we preserve all those really good um, compounds, all these, all that good medicine. And so 
um, yeah, you, it's good to store it in a cool, dark place once it's dry and then it'll last for a really long time. Um, dried herbs usually last between a year or two when it's been stored really well. And after that, you'll still have, um, you can still use it. It just won't have as much flavor, kind of like spices. If you have it in your cabinet for a couple of years, you know, it kind of loses quality over time. So this is uh, my second to last slide. I wanted to kind of go through it quickly to make sure that we have enough time for everybody. But um, here are some of my favorite annuals and perennials. These are things that we grow at Garden, and they've been, um, yeah, they produce really well. They love our climate. And um, really there's a lot of options of things you can do with these herbs, fresh or dried. And you can take a screenshot of this. And I'm also happy to share these slides afterwards. I think Maria had talked about um, making these available. So yeah, you can definitely reference this later as well. The last slide will be my contact info. Uh, if you wanna check out more about what we're doing, you can go to yougardenherbs.com. You can follow me on Instagram. I share a lot about my journey and my PhD and what we're doing at the farm at I am Noelle Joy. And you can also send me an email if you have any questions or would like some more resources. So I'm going to stop sharing and pass it off to Rebecca. She's gonna be talking about uh, kind of what to do with the herbs and really excited to learn from her. Awesome, thank you, Noelle, I appreciate that. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here today and excited to share um, some of my information with you all. Um, so let me just pull this up. All right. So my name is Rebecca Hardiman and, uh, a lot of people know me as Chef Becca. Um, I'm a County Extension Coordinator and Family and Consumer Science Agent serving Clayton County, where we mostly focus on, um, most of our classes and workshops in the area of chronic disease prevention, nutrition, and, overall healthy living. Um, in 2018, I earned my certificate in culinary arts from the Augusta Scoffier School of Culinary Arts. Um, so I love the fact that I can bring this new and different culinary arts perspective to extension. So, and I'm actually very happy to be able to share that with you today. Um, there is a professor emeritus, uh, Mr. Uh, Wayne McLaren, uh, who wrote a publication called Herbs in Southern Gardens. Um, and in this publication, he not only discussed the ways to grow and care for your herbs, but he also highlighted many of the benefits of those herbs after they're grown. And Noel talked about that um, uh, this morning. Most of us think about growing herbs just to cook them or use them as a garnish or um, to use them in a tea. But in addition to herbal teas, there are herb vinegars, there are herb oils, um, and there are even complete meals that you can make. Um, and I'm gonna demonstrate one in a few minutes. And I'm excited to share that with you. Um, I hear several people complain about how herbs go bad so quickly. Um, and so uh, I wanna definitely encourage you to reach out to your local extension office um, because they can give you detailed steps on how to get, get the best life out of your herbs. Um, but uh, Noelle talked about how you know when to pick your herbs, what's the right time um, to be able to get the best life out of them. Um, but what I do and what the National Center for Home Food Preservation um, guides us to do is um, if I'm going to use them in the next couple of days, I simply um, wash them, pat them dry, place them in some paper towels inside a resealable bag, and I can have them in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Um, to preserve them a little bit longer, um, I can actually use my freezer. And so I do the same sort of process by washing them, patting them dry, um, uh, but then I want to use a freezer wrap, and there actually is um, freezer wrap. It's not the same as saran wrap. It's not the same as foil. You definitely want to look for freezer wrap and place that in a um, freezer bag and place that in the freezer. And that will last you a lot longer. Um, and that's how you can extend the life of the herbs that you, um, that you either grow or purchase. All right. 
So let's talk about some of the top herbs that you are probably familiar with and discuss different ways in which they can be um, prepared. Rosemary. Um, rosemary is actually one of my daughter's favorite herbs. Um, it helps to uh, prevent damage to your blood vessels. It can also aid with cardiovascular health. Um, it's a very strongly flavored herb, um, but rosemary goes great with chicken, whole chicken, um, rosemary has many different um, benefits to your health. Same with parsley. Um, it's very high in antioxidants, very high in vitamins A and C. A lot of people use parsley as a garnish, but I do encourage you to try parsley in your actual dishes. Um, I think you'll find that it adds a really great flavor and you're getting more of the benefit because your, um, your intake is higher. Um, ginger appears to be effective for treating a lot of gastrointestinal um, issues, um, especially relieving nausea, but um, it's a powerful anti-inflammatory. It's been shown to reduce joint pain in some situations. Um, and what I would encourage you to do is to think about adding ginger to your desserts um, because uh, you can get the benefit from the ginger, but the taste is amazing and it pairs well with many other um, foods. I think it pairs really well with um, tart fruits. And so I have a recipe for a berry ginger pancake that's really good. Um, and it also um, gives like an extra boost to the flavors. Um, I just recently came back from a trip to West Africa. And while I was there, a lot of people just walking around are chewing on ginger root. Um, and I asked, you know, why, why is this done? And they do it as a preventative um, measure to keep their stomach in line because they eat a lot of spicy foods. So um, there's a great tip there. Um, probably the most well-known of the herbs is garlic. Um, it is a healing herb, um, helps with hypertension um, and even can help with the common cold. I know that um, I've recently received um, a suggestion from a friend um, who said, if you just put some garlic cloves into some hot water and sip it like a tea, it could actually help um, relieve some of those um, cold, um, the things that come with a cold. So, and actually it worked. <laughs> um, so I do encourage you to try adding garlic into some of your, your meals. It's a great flavor enhancer, um, especially in soups and stews. Um, and obviously it's used in many different cultures. So let's talk a little bit about those different cultures um, because there are definitely some distinct herbs that are used in different um, cultures to enhance their food. So for example, you have the Italian cuisine. Um, a lot of the cuisine is focused on oregano and parsley, garlic, basil, and fennel. Um, the other day I did a session on Facebook Live and we made ratatouille. And those are all of the herbs that I used in that dish with the eggplant and the tomatoes um, and the squash and zucchini. Um, South African uh, culture and cuisine uh, uses a lot of cumin and coriander, fennel and scallions. Um, French cuisine um, uses, you know, your thyme, your parsley, your marjoram, your bay, your chives, and um, your rosemary. Um, Greek uh, cuisine focuses on um, the garlic, the mint. There is some dill, uh, parsley, uh, rosemary, and oregano. And then German um, cuisine, which I'm just now starting to explore, so I'm excited and hopefully I'll make a trip to Germany, um, uh, has a lot of dill, a lot of fennel, and a lot of caraway. Um, so I encourage you to try those if you have not yet. But today I do want to focus on one of the herbs that um, Noel did talk about, um, which is hibiscus. And um, traditionally, people know of hibiscus as a tea um, and they use it, they boil it down and, you know, make the tea, whether it's iced or hot or what have you. Um, 
but I have um, been trying to encourage people to use um, certain herbs like hibiscus in their actual meals. And so what I'm gonna demonstrate for you today is that, um, first of all, that it can be done. And second of all, that it can actually take on the flavor of whatever you are adding to it. Um, hibiscus has been known to prevent um, or aid in um, preventing hypertension, um, lowering blood pressure, reducing blood sugar levels. It's very rich in vitamin C um, and it can, contains minerals such as um, flavonoids and has some laxative properties as well, which um, many of us um, uh, as we're getting older could use. Um, it's a bushy annual plant um, and parts of the flower are used to make tea, like I said, but various parts of the plant are also used to make jams and spices, soups, sauces, um, and the flowers are used in some cultures to make medicine. Um, and this is just one of the bags I picked up today at our international market of the dried um, hibiscus. And I'm gonna show you that a little bit closer in a minute. Now, the flavor of hibiscus, um, it's a very tart flavor. And for me, it makes me think of like a cranberry flavor or a pomegranate. Um, so it's not overly sweet. And because of that, um, it works well in savory dishes um, and it won't overpower. Uh, many people right now are looking for meat alternatives um, in their dishes. And so this is actually an opportunity for something different. Um, and so I would love for you to look at this recipe with me. I'm actually gonna stop sharing and I'm going to move my camera so that you can see what I'm doing. So let me stop that share there. I'm gonna tilt it down a little bit and hopefully you can see what I have here. So what I've done is I've actually um, taken my dried hibiscus, that's what this is, the flowers, and I've boiled it down um, for about 10 to 15 minutes. I saved the, the water from boiling it because I can make that into tea later on. So I saved that, but the flowers, when they um, cook down, they get nice and soft and they're almost chewy. And so um, as a texture thing, it can feel in your mouth as like a meat alternative. And so, like I said, hibiscus will take on the flavor of whatever you want to put in it. So what I've done is I made a little mix here. This is my mix for like a taco seasoning. Now, let me tell you, um, the, I never buy taco seasoning at the store. First of all, the sodium content is way too high, right? And then also I can make so much more at home um, for less cost. Uh, you know, they have to package it so that it's shelf stable. If I do it at home, I get the fresher flavors and um, I'm paying less. So this is just a mix of uh, garlic powder, onion powder, some pepper, a little bit of salt, um, smoked paprika, cumin, dried oregano, um, and some red pepper flakes. And so that's the mix that I've used. And all I've done is added it to some red onions. And those red onions have cooked down with a little bit. I did add a little extra with garlic cloves. Um, it's cooked down so that what you have here is what is the texture of like a ground turkey or a ground beef. Um, it smells divine and um, everything has cooked down so that I have my taco filling. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm going to get my tacos here and I'm gonna use this filling as if it was ground meat. You can add whatever you want to this. You can add um, anything that you would normally add to your tacos. So if you wanted to add some tomatoes, you could do that. I have a little bit of queso fresco here that I can add. Um, you can add some uh, avocado to the top or make some fresh guacamole. But this is um, just a diff different way of thinking about um, getting a meal. Um, it's definitely a little bit healthier um, because I didn't add all the sodium and the extra fat, 
Um, and these hibiscus flowers can cook down um, to take on any flavor you want. So one thing I will recommend is trying it out. Hibiscus is not the only herb that you can use to cook a full meal, but the good news is you're getting all of the benefits of this herb. I've also added garlic. Um, I could add a little um, bay leaf if I wanted to, to add a little bit of extra benefit. Um, I've got tomatoes. So I'm getting everything that it is that I'm, I want to get as far as um, vitamins and uh, minerals, um, but it's in a different way. So I would love to hear if anybody is gonna try this recipe. I will actually try to get it out to everyone who's attended today. Um, and then if you try it, I would love to hear about um, how that tastes to you. When I did a taste test with people, they did, did not realize it was not meat. So we'll see. Um, but I do encourage you to explore, get in your kitchen and explore. If you're taking the time to grow your herbs and um, you're taking the time to um, pick your herbs and do all the things and preserve them, take the time to see what you can do um, to cook with them or make some vinegars or make some oils. These are simple things that you can do so that you can increase the benefit that you're getting from, from the herbs. Um, and also, if you wanna start someplace, start with desserts. Um, like I said, the ginger in a dessert is amazing. So um, I, I encourage you to explore and this is what I love to do. So I thank you so much um, for uh, joining us and I'm going to turn this over to Maria. Great, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Noel. I think that that was um, really informative, and I learned a lot, definitely, about herbs, and that makes me want to try your recipe. And we did get quite a few questions that came in while you guys were both um, chatting. So let me try to go through these and answer them in order. The first one that came in is for you, Noel. Um, if you can turn your camera on, that would be great. Melissa writes from Texas, we had some really hard freezes in Texas. Top growth of my old rosemary died back. Do you think the root is still alive? Uh, that's a great question. I think that, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but I would, you know, as the weather's warming up, cut back that kind of dead top growth. And if you see new growth coming out from the bottom, then it's fine. But if not, then it's probably died back. So it's kind of a wait and see on that one. It depends on uh, just kind of observing the plant. Great. And this one is also for you, Noel. Okay. This is from Teresa. Can bronze fennel be used? Let's see. Can bronze fennel be used as the same bulb fennel for culinary dishes? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think you can use the bronze or the the other fennel interchangeably. I think the bronze fennel has like a little bit more of a pungent flavor. Um, maybe Rebecca has something to, to add to that, but it, I would use them interchangeably. Great, thank you. And um, Rebecca, this one is for you. This is from Elizabeth. Will we get this recipe after the call? And she also wants to know if there will be any other recipes that we'll be able to share. So yes, definitely. I can provide the recipe after um, this. And I do have a few others, so we'll add that to it. Yeah, we can definitely post these recipes with um, the slides to the website where you registered for the webinar. Thanks. And then we've got Mary ask, how long do you boil the hibiscus flowers? So I start off by rinsing them really well. You want to rinse them un until that really deep uh, color is gone um, and it's just like a light pink and then I boiled them for about maybe 10 to 15 minutes to boil them down um, and then of course I put them in the skillet to 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 um, saute them great and then we've got Katie wants to know is there a particular type of hibiscus that Rebecca is using oh great question so I'm actually just using the it's called Jamaica um, hibiscus flower. Um, and that's what I'm using. It's just dry Jamaica hibiscus. Uh, and so, um, and you can get it at any kind of, uh, international market. 
and it comes in a little bag like this. I think that answers Karen's question about where you can buy dried hibiscus. So there are other places that you would suggest trying to find it? Um, I, some Walmarts actually sell it in their tea section for people who want to make their own teas, but it's not in every Walmart. I, think I have, I can find it a lot of times at Latin markets also. Absolutely. Yes. And someone um, asked which variety yeah. of hibiscus. I think you answered that. Yeah, I might, I might just add to that. Um, when you're looking for seeds, there's a lot of different kinds of hibiscus and the hibiscus sabdorifa is what's used medicinally. And it's also called roselle, the Thai red roselle. Um, and if you don't mind, I actually I deleted this from my presentation because I was like, didn't want it to go over, but I actually have a picture of hibiscus growing. Um, if, if it's possible just to show that really quickly to see. Yeah, so you, you can, can show that, that totally. Like. You can okay. be able to share your screen again. If, um, um, Rebecca has yeah, stopped screen. yeah. We okay. have a lot of other um, comments too. So while you're pulling that up, I'm going to try to answer these other questions that came up. Okay, um, great. Mark, yeah. say, what about turmeric? Mm. Um, yeah, so just, just, this is a picture of the hibiscus and a lot of people think it's the flower, but it's actually the calyx. So it's this fleshy coating around the seed pod, um, after it's flowered. So you can see it on the plant here. And then this is what it looks like. We cut it off and then remove the seed pod and then dry it. So, so the calyx actually is, um, is what we use for the hibiscus and it's hibiscus sabdorifa. Wow. That's really cool. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Um, Eileen asks, can you dry leafy herbs in the microwave? So for all, um, food preservation, I, I do recommend you visit the national, um, center for home food preservation. It's online, easy to get to, and it will give you the safest way to preserve all of those things. Um, and also, um, explain step-by-step step how to do the process. So that's what I recommend. Good. And then we may have already answered this, but humor me. D asks, is there a particular variety of hibiscus recommended for cooking? And so I think we, yeah, yeah. I think we answered that. And Kendra asks, what are some recommended resources for herbs, herb use and teas and growing to growing to processing and recipes. So the Center for Food Preservation that you mentioned, but maybe any other sources you would recommend? And I would just encourage you to reach out to your local extension office. I mean, and that's in any state, just reach out to your local extension office and your extension agents will be able to give you um, the research-based information. Great. Okay, uh, this one's for you, Noel. Edward asks, what's the difference between holy basil and culinary one? Great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so holy basil, it's, um, it's a medicinal herb from India and it's in the same family. So it's in the um, oxymum family, it's a different species and um, it's got a different flavor profile and a different kind of activity. One of the main compounds found in holy basil that has been studied is eugenol. Uh, it's actually similar to what's found in cloves. Um, so a lot of times holy basil will have a little bit of a spicy quality to it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a different species and the holy basil is typically used in tea uh, and other preparations. And then the culinary basil or, uh, you know, regular basil, I guess, is typically used more in culinary applications. Thanks. Anything you'd like to add to that, Rebecca? Nope, that was right on. <laughs> All right, we've got several other questions. Rebecca asked, does cooking or preparing herbs kill off or remove some of their benefits? And conversely, does it increase them? That's a great question. Um, so obviously um, when you do cook anything down, you are removing some of the nutrients and the vitamins. Um, just like vegetables, you don't want to <laughs> overdo it with your vegetables when you're cooking them. Um, but uh, because of the, the strength of the benefits of these herbs, um, you're still getting the benefit. Obviously, you're probably not getting the same amount as if you were just, um, you know, eating them before boiling them, but the benefit's still there. Great. This is 
Mary in Wisconsin, if sage has overwintered, would you recommend cutting the dead looking branches off or just leaving them? Um, I like to leave the material over the winter. Um, I, I typically don't like to cut back everything before, you know, going into winter. I like to kind of leave it and then see what pops up as the new growth and then kind of like trim back the old growth just so it makes it easier to harvest the new growth, but kind of as habitat maybe for, for animals or insects or things like that. Um, and then also helping the plant kind of give it a little bit more protection. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could be wrong on that, but that's, that's how we do it is I, I tend to leave it in the field and then cut it back before or as we're getting new growth. Great, thank you. And Katie wants to know if Rebecca has a website or a way to share your recipes on Instagram. And I will make sure that Maria, you have all of that information to send out if possible for people who are registered because I have a lot of information to share. <laughs> right, we'll do that. Um, let's see if there's more of a comment. Bill asks, we've heard of the great synergistic effects of certain combinations of herbs and or spices. However, I wonder about maybe more importantly, is there maybe the opposite scenario, a dangerous or unhealthy synergistic effect? If so, what are they? Um, you wouldn't want to accidentally go there. I'm not even sure where I would start to answer <laughs> that. Um, actually, I feel like that would be a great research project. <laughs> so that's something that we um, can definitely look into. Noelle, I don't know if you know of any. I know there's some books out there. I don't have any, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I could look into where, you know, drug herb interactions. Um, I definitely know that there's, um, you know, it's recommended to consult your health, primary health care provider. And I know that there's I know that there's some online sites and some books that give you information about interactions of like herbs you don't want to pair with certain medications or with certain kind of um, health states or <laughs> conditions, I guess. Um, but that would be something I would recommend to talk to your doctor about. Um, and I and I can I can look for more information and try to provide a resource. I just can't think of it off the top of my head right now. I would echo that. I did help facilitate a discussion with one of our extension specialists on campus when we were doing a well a well a wellness webinar um, and she really emphasized kind of the potential for interaction between different types of um, prescription medications in particular so there is some information out there if you want to search for it she actually had even given us a handout I'll try to see if I can find it and post it with this with this talk Trisha, and I just want to add in your exploration of these different herbs there are some herbs that don't go together when they're paired with a certain food so that's something you can look into as well. Like I know, I think it's anise and dill don't go together with carrots. Um, it does something to the carrots. So that's something else to think about. And Trisha asked, are there any places in Athens to purchase herb plants? Noel, I know you know the answer to that. <laughs> I, um, as I say, we just had a plant sale a couple of weeks ago, but there is uh, Nona Farm. If they want to Google Nona Farm, they have extra plants from the plant sale that they have on a barn to door website that they're still selling currently. And they had a lot of really cool varieties of some different herbs and native and edible and dye plants, actually. So they're currently selling them right now if you're interested. And it's Nona Farm. Okay. And when you say you had a sale that you garden had a sale recently, right? Yeah. You had a good turnout. We went, there were lots of people. Oh, excellent. Yes. <laughs> yes, um, it was great. Yeah. So um, I can't pronounce this name, but they want to know if you've ever tried other flowers, like, I don't know how to pronounce this, the stir. Can you see it in a <laughs> question? <laughs> it's the P-L-B-E-E -E name, Nasturum, N-A-S-T-U-R-S. -S I-U-M. I should be able to pronounce that. Oh, right. nasturtium. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, I love nasturtiums. Um, they taste kind of like arugula. It's like a, um, the, the sweetness of the flower gives it almost like a sweet arugula taste. Um, so I, I love adding flowers to salads. Um, and, and the leaves are also 
edible and kind of have a spicy flavor. So I forget what the question was, but I, I think it was, can you yeah, eat it? If you've yeah. used that flour. Yeah. I think that was yes. the gist of it. Yes. Um, there's a question from Katie on does culinary basil have any medicinal benefit? Yes, um, it does. It's very high in vitamin K um, and a few other uh, nutrients. So yes. And then is there a nutritional difference between freezing or drying herbs? That's a question from Pam. That is a great question. And I actually am not sure. So I would have to go back to that National Center for Home Food Preservation to find out. Um, someone wants to know if you can spell the scientific name of hibiscus. <laughs> we can look that up and post that so you don't have to do that online if you don't want to. Um, Mary asks, can Jerusalem sage be used in cooking? She planted it for the flower but wonders about cooking with it. Absolutely. It is edible. Yes. And has great benefits. So yes, definitely. And Madeline says, has hibiscus powder been used in cooking? Um, I do know it's been used in um, drinks, um, but I don't see why it could not be used in cooking. Um, you would definitely have to play around with it because um, you don't want to overpower your dish, um, but you also want to make sure you're getting the, the benefits from it. Great. And then we have a question from Diana. What herbs would you recommend for agroforestry plantings in the southeast with pine and hardwood plantings. So I assume that would be like in the understory. Yeah, actually, um, I would recommend them to look at Janine Davis. She is a researcher at North Carolina State University that has done a bunch of work and even written a book about growing woodland medicinals. So I don't have a lot of experience with that, but there's a whole book written about it and a whole research program about things that you can do in a forest. Uh, with growing medicinal herbs. Okay, a couple more questions from Amanda. How do herbs do when started by direct seed or is it mostly just independent on the species or dependent, sorry. <laughs> um, a lot of herbs grow great from seed. Uh, somet sometimes like with mint, for example, uh, kind of like apples where if you sow a seed from an apple tree, you're not gonna get the same flavor of apple. There's a lot of genetic diversity in the seed. So with mints, sometimes if you're trying to save seed, when you grow a plant from seed, it won't be the same as the plant where it came from. Um, you might get a different flavor profile. So for certain things, I would recommend taking cuttings. So having a plant um, and then taking a little piece off of it, stripping off the bottom half of the leaves and then putting it in a glass of water. And then that'll develop a root system. And so you can kind of create a new plant through this um, vegetative propagation. But yeah, I mean, most herbs do well from seed. It just might take a little bit of experimentation and time to figure out the best conditions to get it to germinate. Great. All right, well, we have lots of comments thanking you guys for doing such a great job and um, piquing our interest in learning more about herbs growing and using them. Um, I did have a couple more comments just from people about what types of plants may be uh, poisonous. So we will try to post some resources about that and not try to necessarily answer those because that can get into um, a lot deeper topic. But ladies, great job. Thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us this morning. We had an awesome audience and I am glad that um, they were so engaged. Lots of questions means they were really engaged. One last question. I make medicine balls at the same time I'm using peppermint extract. Can I use the actual peppermint leaf? Um, I, I really like using the, the, the real herb in place of maybe an extract or an essential oil. So I guess I'll just say I, in, in making like a culinary oil or something I even going to put on my skin, I really like making infused oils with like holy basil or rose or calendula or things like that. So I guess for me, it's a pretty easy answer. Like, yes, definitely use the, use the real herb instead of the extract. Great. Okay. Well. I think we will end with that. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great rest of your day and um, stay tuned until next time.